The Blue Zones project began in 2004 when American explorer Dan Buettner teamed up with National Geographic to identify the places in the world where communities lived considerably longer and better than the average person. Mr. Buettner identified five of these places termed Blue Zones and with the help of scientists began to research just what characteristics extended the longevity of these communities. He discovered that these long-living communities shared several characteristics, including a strong sense of family, constant physical activity, and they lean towards a plant-based diet. Our guest today is Brenda Davis, a registered dietitian and an internationally acclaimed speaker. She's co-author of nine books on vegetarian and vegan nutrition and is a contributing author to a tenth book, The Complete Vegetarian. In 2007, she was inducted into the Vegetarian Hall of Fame. And today she'll be answering frequently asked questions about all types of diets, as well as providing some tips on the best way to stay healthy. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. Brenda, welcome to Australia. We're delighted to have you on our It Is Written program today. Well, thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be here. And I am very happy to be in Australia because it is summer here and it is winter in Canada. <laughs> National Geographic have published a, a fascinating article on the blue zones uh, relating to, to health and longevity. What's that all about? Well, the blue zones, it, really, really interesting research. Dan Buettner is the sort of the lead person on this. And what he did was he looked around the world at the healthiest longest lived people. And, you know, these people, it's not just that they live to be 100 years, but in their later years, they're actually productive, healthy, doing everything that they did when they were 70 at 100 years of age. One of the interesting stories Dan Buettner tells is when he went to Okinawa to interview a 100-year-old man, and he arrived at his home knowing that he lived with his 70-year-old son. And he saw this man walking towards his garden with shorts on, all the tools thrown over his shoulder, and he was walking very briskly. And he thought, ah, there's the son. And he ran over and said, could you tell me I'm here to interview your father? And it turned out that he was talking to the father. <laughs> So they are just very productive at these advanced years. And the interesting thing about the blue zones, there are really five blue zones that are sort of the most well-recognized. And they are Okinawa, Japan, Loma Linda, California, which are the Seventh-day Adventists that are vegetarian Adventists. And I think with the studies we have now, I think that needs to be expanded to vegetarian Adventists everywhere. Uh, then the, uh, the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, um, Icaria, Greece, and Sardinia, Italy. So these are the five blue zones. And, and these are areas where there, there are pockets of population who, who live longer than other, other parts of the, the country or the world. Absolutely. And so they're, they're, they have the greatest numbers of centenarians. These are people that are living to 100, but very healthy at those advanced ages. What's really interesting is there are some common threads that we can weave through every single blue zone on the planet. So of these blue zones, uh, where people live longer and healthier, there are things that they have in common. Exactly. So, and the things are, number one, they all have a very strong sense of family. Number two, they are highly socially engaged. So very nice cultures. They, number three, they all do constant, moderate physical activity. Number four, they tend not to smoke. And there are two lifestyle factors that are diet related. And they are, they all consume plant-based diets and they all consume legumes. So, so there are only, um, you know, there, there's one population that's vegetarian, the rest are plant-based, not completely vegetarian, but all plant-based. So Brenda, studies have shown specifically in regards to the Adventist Health Study and Epic Oxford, 
the secret of longer living, healthier lives. Results have shown lower mortality rates among those who follow a plant-based diet and those who do not. What else was found from these studies and what does this tell us about the link between diet and disease? You know, when we talked about the blue zones, we know that people tend to do very well on plant-based diets, but these two studies are really our gold standards. They prove beyond any doubt because what they do is actually they're comparing not just vegetarians to the general population, but they're comparing similar health conscious omnivores, people who eat meat, uh, semi-vegetarians, people who eat meat not more than once a week, uh, pesco vegetarians, which are people that are vegetarian plus fish, and uh, lacto-ovo vegetarians, those are people that are vegetarian but they eat eggs and dairy, and then vegans that don't consume any animal products at all. And these studies also control for all the confounding variables like body weight and socioeconomic status and ac activity level and all of these smoking and so forth. The Seventh-day Adventist study compared to the general population, vegetarian men live almost 10 years longer and women live over six years longer. And then in terms of risk reduction for mortality, the vegan men do the best, a 28% risk reduction. Uh, and the vegetarians on whole, or the vegans as a group, about a 15% risk reduction compared to about a, a 12% or a, about 11%, I think it is, for the lacto-ovo vegetarians. So very, very interesting uh, data. And if we look at, again, the, uh, the cardiovascular disease risk, for example, what we see in Epic Oxford is a 32% risk reduction when body weight isn't adjusted for, and about a 28% risk reduction when body weight is adjusted for. So very significant. In the Adventist Health Study, vegan men had a 55% risk reduction for ischemic heart disease and a 42% risk reduction for uh, cardiovascular disease. Just really quite remarkable. And then for cancer, the Epic Oxford showed a 19% risk reduction for, cardio for uh, cancer in vegans, about a 12% for pesco vegetarians and about an 11% for lacto-ovo vegetarians. In the Adventist Health Study, the numbers were similar. So really quite a remarkable risk reduction. In many other diseases, the Epic Oxford showed a 40% risk reduction for cataracts in vegans. Uh, we see a risk reduction of 52% in renal disease for, uh, for, ve for vegetarians, both vegetarians and vegans, in the Adventist Health Study. We also saw a risk reduction of, uh, for hypertension, 75% for vegans, 55% for lacto-ovo vegetarians, so, and, and uh, diabetes. Unbelievable, the risk of getting diabetes in omnivores was about seven, close to 8%, and as you go down and remove more and more animal products, by the time you get to vegans, the risk is about 2.9%. Mm. So just a remarkable difference. And the risk of developing diabetes in the people that didn't have diabetes over the next two years, the same population, was 62% lower among the vegans. It was, I think, about, well, it was de definitely uh, very significantly 30-something, 30 34% maybe among lacto-ovo vegetarians and then slightly less among the pesco vegetarians, but vegans had a very huge advantage in that regard. So for multiple diseases, very significant differences between people eating fewer animal products and the people eating uh, an omnivorous, uh, omnivorous diet. So th those statistics are just, are just remarkable and, and a reminder that what we eat affects our health and well-being. I love what you just said, because when you think about it, food is not just fuel. A lot of people think of food is our fuel. Food is our fuel, but it is also the raw material with which our brains are built from, with which every single cell of our body is made. This is what we are made of, literally. So it doesn't make sense to think that what we eat is not gonna impact our health. It has to, profoundly. So we want the food we eat to be contributing to health and healing, 
rather than contributing to disease. I think of it this way. When you have a disease that's a diet and lifestyle induced disease, what you put in your mouth can serve as gasoline on the fire. And that's exactly what it does when you're eating unhealthy foods, or it can serve as water on the fire when you're consuming healthy plant-based foods. So these are decisions that each of us really make for ourselves. Absolutely, there is nobody that can eat for you or exercise for you. You are the captain of that ship. You know, and you have a responsibility to take care of your body. Now, we all want to eat right, but we are just uncertain of, of where to begin. So what are the steps that you can recommend for us to follow to have a healthy diet? Well, I think first of all, step number one is to make the foundation of your diet whole plant foods. So when I say whole plant foods, we're talking about, you know, 10 servings or more of vegetables and fruits. That's ideal. I mean, a lot of people aren't gonna achieve that, but I know for myself, I eat probably 12 to 14 a day. So we want a lot of colorful fruits and vegetables. Maybe three green, this is what I often say, three green, two yellow orange, one red, one purple blue, and one white beige. Because all of these foods have unique beneficial uh, properties, antioxidants, phytochemicals, anti-inflammatory compounds, fiber, all of these things that are so protective. We want to include legumes. So we're talking about beans. Even soy foods like tofu and tempeh are excellent choices. Uh, and we want to make sure we're getting nuts and seeds on a daily basis. A lot of people think, oh, they contain fat, I shouldn't eat them. But the fat they contain is protective, it's healthy fat. They are very important sources of vitamin E, they're important sources of trace minerals, so those are important. And whole grains, and the best whole grains are intact intact whole grains. So just like they're taken off the plant. So for example, quinoa, barley, um, black rice, red rice, brown rice, uh, oat groats, those kinds of foods are ideal. Now, of course, you can cut up a grain, you can roll a grain, you can shred a grain, and it's still a whole grain and it's still healthful. But as soon as you start puffing a grain, you're starting to do damage, even grinding a grain. You're increasing the surface area so much that you increase the, you know, the impact it has on your blood sugar. And what do you do with, you know, when you, you, you take these whole grains and you turn them into refined grains, then we're talking, you know, trouble. I'll, t I'll tell you more about that on another step. But getting back to this step, so we want, these are our primary foods, fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts and seeds, those are the key. Once you've got that, step two is to really look at your sources of macronutrients. You can't go wrong if you're going with whole plant foods, but macronutrients are protein, carbohydrates, and fats. So you know where fat is concerned. For years, people have thought fat is bad. We don't want fat, get fat out of the diet. But what we learn from the people in the blue zones is some people consume 10% of calories from fat, some consume 35% of calories from fat, and they're all blue zones. The deal is, is it doesn't matter as much the percent of macronutrients. What really matters is where those macronutrients are coming from. So where fat is concerned, we want it to come from nuts and seeds and avocados mainly. And, and where protein is concerned, Legumes have so many advantages over animal protein foods because you get plant sterols, you get fiber, you get phytochemicals, you get antioxidants, you get all of these things, and you don't get saturated fat and cholesterol and the you know pro-inflammatory compounds in meat and all of the chemical contaminants in meat and all of those things. So so you know for for protein and then for carbohydrates, here's where we are making huge mistakes as a culture and as a population. Carbohydrates have, they're now the bad guys. You always hear, you know, low carb diets, low carb diets. But the reality is, is people in the blue zones consume 50 to 80% of calories from carbs. Almost all the people in the Western world, 90% of their carbohydrates are coming from refined foods, refined carbohydrates. So you take a grain of wheat and you remove everything of value from the wheat, the germ and the bran, and what are you left with? 
you're left with what we call endosperm. And endosperm is pure starch. There's very little nutritional value left, a little bit of protein, a few vitamins and minerals. The fiber's gone. Most of the tr trace minerals are gone. A lot of the vitamin E is gone. And then what do you do? Do you eat a bowl of white flour? Nobody eats a bowl of white flour. What do you do before you eat the bowl of white flour? You add a bunch of junk to it. You add fat, sugar, salt, preservatives, additives, colors, flavors, and then you eat the bowl of white flour, right? As cookies and crackers and you know all of these foods that are made with white flour. And then we wonder why we're dying of these diet-induced diseases. You can't remove everything of value that's naturally present in a plant, add a bunch of junk to it, and think it's gonna sustain human health. That just doesn't happen. And what we know now is when you replace saturated fat in meat with refined carbohydrates, you do as bad or worse than you would do by eating the saturated fat. So it's just we need to really reduce these refined carbohydrates. When people get their carbohydrates from whole plant foods, where there's fiber and phytochemicals and antioxidants in with those carbohydrates, the carbohydrates are consistently protective to human health. So that's number two. Number three, we want to make sure our diets are nutritionally adequate. So when you're eating a plant-based diet, you need to worry about vitamin B12. It's not naturally present in plant foods. So you need either fortified foods or you need a supplement. And it's not a matter of, well, that just proves you need meat. You know, B12 is in meat because it, it, animals, we have, we're full of B12. It just happens to be mainly in the large colon. We don't get much from the large colon. So we, we produce a little bit if we have really bad oral hygiene. But what we do to our plants and what we do to our food supply is we try to get rid of pathogenic bacteria. And in the process, we get rid of good bacteria as well. That's one of the reasons we have to cook meat to death is because it's got all this pathogenic bacteria. And of course, along with that is the B12 producing bacteria as well. So it's not something magically superior about meat that it has B12. We just happen to take out that bacteria from where it would naturally be present uh, before we eat our food. So uh, it's, it's just really important that we ensure a source of B12. Vitamin D if we're not getting enough sunshine, iodine if we don't use iodized salt or iodine-rich foods. So we have to be careful about micronutrients. That's number three. And number four is we want to maximize protective components like fiber. So fiber, most people eat maybe 15 or 20 grams of fiber a day. We need probably 35 to 50 for, for optimal health. And so where's fiber located? Beans are our best source, vegetables, fruits, whole grains are very rich sources of fiber. So plant foods are our fiber source. So we need to be focusing on those. Where, you know, what foods contain zero fiber? Animal products. Meat, dairy products, oil, and sugar contain no fiber at all. So fiber comes from whole plant foods. Then we need to make sure we're maximizing our intake of um, phytochemicals and antioxidants. And these, again, are just huge in these variety of plant foods. We need the color, we need the variety. And some of the richest sources are things like nuts and seeds and whole grains and, and, uh, and legumes. It's not just fruits and vegetables. And then one of the other things we really need to do is, is this would be number six if I'm not mistaken. We need to make sure that we are feeding our gut microbiota, the, the, the bugs in our gut, we want them to be healthy because they affect everything about health from our immune function to our body weight to the way that our brain works. It's unbelievable how important these, these gut bacteria are. And when we eat a diet that's high in refined carbohydrates and, and meat, especially processed meat, uh, we are feeding bad bacteria. When we eat a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables and fiber, we are feeding the good gut bacteria and that makes a huge difference to health. So that's important. And I think the last thing that I, I would just urge people to try to you know, maintain a healthy body weight. And that, that means in some cases eating fewer calories but exercising more as well. But the thing that we have to recognize is that 
In our culture, we've supersized everything and we've got to pull back on our portion sizes. It's just unbelievable to look at what, what you know, people ate in the 1950s versus what they ate today, they eat today as a portion. You know, it used to be that a, a, a soft drink was seven ounces, now it's 30 or 40 ounces. A burger was three ounces, now it's 12 or 14 ounces. Everything is expanded. We supersize everything. And when we supersize our food, we supersize our people. In the United States, 70% of the population is overweight or obese. In Australia and Canada, it's 60%. These are just really ridiculous numbers. And when we're overweight or obese, we increase our risk of every disease you can think of. And so we, you know, we really need to be looking at how we can cut back using smaller, you know, dishes, eat, just serving ourselves rather than putting the meal on the, the table, serving to our plate, bringing the plate to the table, uh, not drinking our calories. So drinking sugar is just, we know the worst thing you can possibly do, drink water. Drink herbal tea. If you want to drink anything with calories, make it fresh squeezed vegetable juice. You can add an apple or a few carrots or whatever is fine, but you want to be drinking something that's just full of, of you know, beneficial compounds, not sugar. You can certainly replace a meal with a smoothie and that's okay. It won't be as satiating or as satisfying as eating those foods in the whole form. But nonetheless, for people that are on the run, it can still be a reasonable meal. If you're adding nuts and seeds and all sorts of fruits and vegetables, it can be quite a, a reasonable choice. So I think that kind of covers the steps that a person needs to take to make their diet healthier. And it's not about being perfect. It really is not. We are all human. We all want to treat once in a while. But what, you know, what's, what's true is that every step you take in the right direction is worth celebrating. It's, you know, I always think sometimes we almost, our, our desire to become absolutely perfect can impede our, our effect on other people because we don't want people to feel like it's impossible to do. We want people to feel compassion around these changes. And so when a person falls, the last thing in the world we need to do is kick them in the shins. We need to embrace them and help them back up and uh, just love them. And, and so I think we need to remember this is really a journey. It's, it's, uh, it, and, and it doesn't matter as much where you are on the journey as you are on that journey towards optimal health. So Brenda, the secrets or the steps to a healthy diet, it's pretty simple. It's very simple. The science is very complicated. The solution is very simple. Brenda, we've covered a lot of territory on good health today. If people want to find out more information, if they want to review some of the information that's been shared, where would you recommend they go? Well, first of all, I have to give myself a plug and say I've written about nine books on these topics, and uh, certainly they're loaded with information. The last one was written in 2014, 611 pages called the Becoming Vegan Comprehensive Edition. And so people can go to my website, brendadavisrd.com. I have another website called becomingvegan.ca. And uh, that's a, you know, those are perfect resources. Uh, Michael Greger has nutritionfacts.org. Little videos that you can get coming uh, into your inbox, two to four minutes and provide you with updates. Uh, and the other thing that right here in Australia that I was involved with is this uh, Medical Journal of Australia, which is actually available free online. It's open access journal. And this entire issue is on vegetarian nutrition. So it covers protein, iron, B12. I was involved in the essential fatty acid article. So it covers all of the key issues on vegetarian nutrition. And uh, so this is a resource that you want to take a look at. Brenda Davis, it's been a pleasure to have you on our It Is Written program today. I want to thank you and wish you all the very best in your endeavours. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a privilege. 
Thank you, Brenda, for your time today. There's a lot of conflicting information out there, and I'm very glad you've been able to answer those important questions for us. We wouldn't put coke in our petrol tanks, so why would we put the wrong fuel in ourselves? Did you know that the Bible describes our bodies as temples? We can find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Instead of abusing our health and consequently our bodies, we should be treating our bodies with reverence and care. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, the Apostle Paul also tells us that whatever we eat, drink or do should be for God's glory. God wants us to live happy, healthy lives. He longs for us to enjoy the full benefits of stamina, endurance and a lifetime of good health. I want those things, don't you? Why not contemplate this as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for caring about our health. We know that you desire good things for us and that we have the power to have those good things by making the right choices. Help us to make the right decisions that will bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you've been inspired by this week's program, be sure to join us again next week when It Is Written will present another new and thought-provoking perspective on the peace, insight, understanding and hope that only the Bible can give us. It Is Written truly is television that changes lives. Until next week, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. <laughs>